I'd like to preach to you a message entitled Renovated to Renovate. Renovated to Renovate. Let's begin with a word of prayer if we could. Father in heaven, we come to this time, this night, and Father, there are some people who desperately want to learn from the word of God. Open your wonderful truths, please, to them. I ask, oh God, that you would help me. You know that the things we're going to share tonight are a little bit, the phrases, a bit detailed at points. And I just pray, Lord, that this time would go like, would be refreshing springs of water to the people, to the hearts that need to look at the Lord, come away from the world for a little bit, for people who desire to be like the Lord Jesus Christ, for people who, who need a revival of, their, of the grace that has been given to them. Certainly, they'll never lose that precious grace, but we need to see it fresh. And I ask, oh God, that you would just work in our hearts. Lord, I love you so much, and I thank you for pulling a wretch like me out of the gutter. And I thank you so much for saving me, for keeping me from a million things. I thank you, Father, for your upholding hand. I thank you for your love that you have given us a family in this church, the joyful thing it is to be with them. And I thank you for your precious word, and I pray, Lord, you would, only by the opening of our eyes can we understand. We thank you for the Lord Jesus, who we're learning more and more, is so highly exalted in eternity. And I pray that you would just bless this time in Christ's name. Amen. Chapter 1 of Ephesians was just chuck full of doctrinal salvation blessings. In fact, some of you are still uh, looking at those things. I would just encourage you. I believe that it's one of the best uh, how do you say the best? It's one of the greatest chapters in the Bible to understand who you are in Christ. It is a wonderful thing. If you're ever depressed or discouraged or the Satan or Satan is lying to you, go to Ephesians chapter 1 and just read slowly. It will greatly encourage your heart. It's chock full with salvation blessings that God has given to those who are saved. He calls us the church. You remember the word is ecclesia, out called. The ones called out of this world. Look at chapter, or verse number 23 of of chapter 1 where we stop, which is his body, that's us, the fullness, Ephesians 1, 23, which is his body, the fullness of him, of Jesus, that filleth all in all. We are his fullness, the one who fills everything. We saw a wonderful truth that we are Jesus' functioning body and actually, we actually complete him that completes everything. That'll blow your mind. How do you complete the perfect God the Son? Yet the Word of God over and over in several passages talks about this. His experience of becoming the Savior and the head of the church made him full and complete. Something that he had not experienced before. He became a man and took on flesh and dwelt among us and forever has those memories. Christ was altered. How can you alter perfection? I have no idea, but he was made full and we are his fullness. This was his plan. He, was, uh, exalt, he exalted himself in this experience. Him, uh, he took us and made himself complete, and we reap the benefits of that work of grace. We are complete in him, and he is complete in us. It's a grunt, wonderful truth. Now look to Ephesians chapter 2. Would you stand, please, as we read 10 verses tonight? We set ourselves on this beautiful, this wonderful thing called salvation. And you hath he quickened. A middle English word which means made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past ye walk according to the course of, the, of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation, or our behavior, and time past, and the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we are dead in sins, hath quickened us, made us alive together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, literally in the heavenlies, in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us or to us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, that not yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship. The emphasis is on him, his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works, that God, which God hath before ordained, that we should walk in them. You may be seated. Chapter 2 continues to explain 
so the salvation blessings to those that God has saved. Now, I'd like to show you four stages of salvation restoration. And basically, it, it's the idea of where you were to where you are now to where you're going to be. Four stages. Listen, don't ever allow the preaching of God's grace to, go, uh, to, to, to be taken for granted by you. What I'm saying tonight, the worst thing you could possibly say is, I know how Jesus saved us. I know how he saved me. I'm going to put myself on autopilot tonight. God has wonderful phrases and wonderful truths that he wants to encourage your life from, to conform you to the image of Jesus Christ. You need to get them. It's not enough for me to say, this passage is about Jesus saving you. No, there's phrase after phrase after phrase after phrase where God wants to chip away and shape and like a diamond that is taken from the rough and, and shaved and polished and made into a beautiful jewel. That's what he wants to do with your understanding of his grace. Now follow along. Stay with me. When we talk about restoration and what God has done to us, I think about uh, a visit that we had. My, my son and I, when we were, with, were down at uh, Seaford at Bayview, Bayview Baptist Church, and we were out visiting, we were going from house to house to house, and we came to this house where there was a, there, the garage was open, and there was the most beautiful mid-1960s restored Corvette that I've ever seen, maybe. You know, I mean, it was beautiful. It was close to, close to the most beautiful I've ever seen. And I, and I talked to the man, and he walked up, he opened the engine, showed us all these things, and showed us how, how uh, he had restored this and talked about it a little bit, and just beautiful, and about how he drove it, and oh, just beautiful, guys. And I, I know if you understand uh, how beautiful, cor uh, a convertible maroon, you know, it has chrome everywhere and wheels to match, just a gorgeous renovation. He talked, uh, he wasn't all excited, though. And as he talked on, what stuck in his crawl was how much money and how much work that he had put into that renovation. He groaned as he told us about the multitudes of money and how far he had to yet go to have that thing perfect to making it nice. He, he wasn't finished. It was an ongoing work. That example is very similar to what we find in this passage. God tells us how he found us, number one. What he showed us, number two how he changed us, number three, and what he made us, number four. And I'd like to show you those four details, how he found us, what he, uh, what he showed us, how he changed us, and what he made us. And by the end of that, we'll be at the end of verse number 10, and we'll be ready to apply it to our hearts. How he found us, verse number one through three, and you hath he quickened who are dead in trespasses and sin, where in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit which now worketh in the children of disobedience. This is how he found us when he came to us to save us, among whom we also had uh, all had our conversation in time past in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others, even as the others that are unsaved. You'll notice in verse number one, there are a few words that are italicized. That means the translators have added them to help you understand. In this occasion, it's called interpolation. It's pulled from verse number five and brought up to verse, you'll see it also in verse number five, and brought up to verse number one so you would understand that he's made you alive. It's a tool that translators use for uh, readers to understand better. And so, understanding that this is not in the original text, this is how it's read. Look at it without the italicized words. And you who were dead in trespasses and sins. That's how he found you. And verse 2 and verse 3 go on. He opens up this passage in great despair of where he found you. If you can remember what you were the moment before you got saved, cry out amen tonight. Do you remember how he found you? Do you remember what it's like to come to the foot of the cross with the burdens like Pilgrim carried and Pilgrim's Progress and come to the place where you're in, you're in despair? You need, you need something. That's where he found you, dead in trespasses and sin. Notice when God saved each of us, he found us dead in trespasses and sin. The word sin here and trespasses speaks of getting out of line. Uh, trespasses means unintentional falls. Sins talks about uh, missing God's mark, as most of you know, the illustration of an arrow that falls short of the target. All of these things, side slips, sin and trespasses, these two words cover all those meanings. We were groping to be good enough, but there was no way that we possibly could. We tried so hard to aim our bow at the, at the target of God's perfection, and our arrow always fell short. We were dead to God and falling short. The most self-righteous person in this, in this world and in this room still falls short of God's standard. There's no way to achieve it. 
See how this dead in sins is described in verse number 2. Wherein in times past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. We walked according to the course of this world. The word course literally means the time. We live like the, the times that we were in. The course is the world's times before we were saved. We did whatever everyone around us in the time did that was popular. No matter if it was sin or not sin. We were, another word the, the, the Lord uses is a jello word. We were conformed to this world. We are conformed to the times. We fit in to the times. I can say this. Hopefully she won't watch on the internet. She's home with her sick mother. But uh, teens don't listen to this. But I'm getting, I have now a junior hire who's coming into uh, teenhood years. And every teen that's in here that has made that transition or is making that transition has a decision to make whether you're going to conform to this world, to the times, the course of the world. Before we were saved, we all conformed to this world. We all walked according to this world, willing to follow what the world was doing, being right in step with the world. Many of you can remember a time before salvation you desired to be like this world. You wanted to fit in. You didn't know what, uh, you know, to know that friendship uh, with this world, uh, what is becoming is enmity or an enemy of Christ. That didn't mean anything to you. Before salvation, the verse number two says, look what it says. It says, uh, according to the course of, or according uh, to the prince of the power of the air. You're dead in trespasses and sins. You're trying to walk according to the time of this world, but also according to the prince of the power in the air. It wasn't just a time. It wasn't just a popularity. It was a person you're walking after. A person. And that person is described as the prince of the power of the air. That's a fancy title for Satan. That spirit, verse says, look at it. It now worketh presently in the children of disobedience. Don't be fooled. The, per, the unsaved person and what you were before you were saved is someone who was controlled by the devil. You did his bidding just like the Holy Spirit tugs on your heart to do his bidding now. You were controlled by the devil. The people that we see in the world, the unsaved, they are under a different captain. The prince of the power in the air. Do you realize that Satan controlled you before you were saved? He is probably called the prince of the power of the air. Uh, and it's funny, if you look back in, in, it's great looking back at church history. When radios first came out, a lot of Christians banned them because they thought Satan was the prince of the power of the air. And certainly it must be evil to, uh, to uh, have a radio because Satan is the prince of the power of the air. We know, of course, now we're so much more intellectual. That's really referring to cell phones, you know, that, that, that they're <laughs> evil and wicked, okay? The prince of the power of the air is probably, he's probably called that because in chapter 6 of this same book, Ephesians 6 and verse 12, he, it's described that Satan has a, 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 a minions, over, an authority over an organization that dwells in the heavenly places or in the air. And his demons literally dwell there. I don't want to scare you, but that's what it says in chapter 6, verse 12. Probably why he's called the prince of the power of the air, because of these minions that are around. Jesus also calls him the prince of this world in John 12, verse 31, and says, by the way, that prince is going to be defeated. Okay? He says that the, the prince is going to be knocked down. Jesus says that, and I say it too. Before you were saved, you were controlled by Satan. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm saying that before you were saved, Satan told you what to do. Now, not audibly, I'm not saying that. He influenced you. He controlled you. You did his bidding, what he wants you to do, just like God, the Holy Spirit, moves you today. You were controlled by the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that worketh right now in the children of disobedience. Who is that? The unsaved. We should not be surprised when unsaved people act exceedingly sinful. It should not make you gasp, whatever. They're controlled by a prince. They're just doing their prince's bidding. It should, we should not be surprised and treat unbelievers with great contempt. The spirit of Satan works in them just like it worked in us and just like it worked in Judas to betray Christ. John 8, 44, Jesus says, You're of your father the devil, the lust of the father you will do. Your father you will do. Did you get that? You're of your father the devil, okay? Your captain, the prince of the power of air. And what's that mean? You will do his lusts. What he bids you do, you will do. You know, that is why uh, in a, a great picture of, of looking at someone who professes Christ but lives for the lusts of the flesh and the lusts of the world is a great identifier and a great flag that they are controlled by a different spirit. 
Do you understand what I'm saying? Not the profession, but the demonstration of the life is which spirit controls you. You can tell who's saved, all right? We're not the judge. God is the judge, but I'm just saying. The, that is a great indicator which spirit you're controlled by. How did God find us? The third way he says he found us in verse number three, among whom we also, uh, we all had our conversation. We all had our behavior in times past in the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And we're by nature the children of wrath, even as others. The idea here is there was no inhibitions. Before you were saved, you may have struggled a little bit with your conscience. But once you seared your conscience, you could do what you wanted to do. In fact, the struggle, the sin struggle, is much harder since you're saved than before you were saved. I've had guys even tell me that. I was saved at a pretty early age. But I, I've had people tell, uh, people tell me that have been saved you know, later on in life when they got involved in sin. You know, I used to never have a problem doing these things. And all of a sudden, uh, it was very obvious that I was saved because I didn't want to use that kind of language anymore. I didn't want to go to those places anymore. I couldn't just uh, drink down a beer without thinking about it anymore. You know, there was something that happened to me. Before we were saved, God found us. We had our behavior and the lusts and the desires of our flesh, what our body wanted to do. As long as we didn't know that we were going to be thrown into the slammer and something didn't hold us back, we did. There was no Holy Spirit in us. There was no new man in us. There was no word of God to slow us down. The Bible says here, verse 3, we fulfilled the desires of the flesh and of the mind. What my mind wanted to think, I thought. Oh, it may, it may have been slowed down by your conscience and your mama said don't think about bad things and angry things or whatever. But once you got beyond that, whatever you wanted to think, after, after all, it's your own territory. There was no one who owned you except the devil and he liked you to think of those thoughts. Many of you remember a time when there was no real struggle between sin and righteousness. You just fulfilled the desires of the flesh and the mind. God found us. The last phrase in verse number three is the children of wrath, even as other unsafe. Think about what that means. We're the children of wrath. It's the idea of growing up into something. You are growing up and the maturity came in hell. You are the children of wrath, growing up into just waiting for the time that you are old enough to experience the judgment of God. That's where he found you. You are growing up, up, up to maturity of damnation. We were the children of wrath, and those that are lost that we preached about this morning that we need to have a burden for, they are the children of wrath, even as others. You were like them. You were just like them. There was a time, listen, you were not saved from your mother's womb as the heretics preach. There was a time that you were destined for uh, the, an eternity in the lake of fire, separated from God. You were the children of wrath. God's wrath abided on you. It was just a matter of when you'd get there. These four descriptions are how God found us. It is a gloomy scene that can be summed up as dead to God in verse number one. Aliens and strangers and under his wrath and dead in sin. But there are two wonderful words. And some of you said amen already because you know where the two wonderful words are. It's found in verse number four. But God, amen. he broke in on the scene. That's how you were. You were just growing up to be damned. That's how it were. And please understand, children, tell your, parents tell your children that the preacher wasn't cussing, okay? You are just growing up to damnation. You are just growing up maturity. Children of wrath. When you got old enough, boom, lake of fire. That's where you have been. But God stepped in. And he stopped your growth process of the children of wrath. He says, you know, I'm going, to, I'm going to stunt your growth. And I'm going to change you from a child of wrath to something else, a child of grace. But God stepped in. Notice how he came to your dead and sin's life. And he showed you two wonderful things in verse number four. But God who is rich, he showed you his rich in mercy and he showed you his great love wherewith he loved you. Two wonderful things he showed you. He let you in on his secret that he was merciful and that he loved you. That's a great thing. New Testament mercy carries the idea of tender compassion. It is God not giving someone the justice that they deserve. It's kind of the opposite idea of grace. Grace is when God gives you something you don't deserve. Mercy is when he doesn't give you something you do deserve, and that's a lake of fire. Mercy, he stepped in, he said, he says, I'll tell you what. He says, I love you, and I want to save you, and I'm not going to give you what you deserve. But God, the verse says, but God is a picture of pity from God for all the sin of verse number 1 through 3. If you just follow along with me in verse 1 through 3, what do you deserve? What does someone who allows their mind and their flesh to do whatever it wants to do? What someone deserve who's dead in sins? What someone deserve that walks according to the time of this world, conform to the world? What someone deserve that is, is, is ruled by a captain, Satan? We deserve hell. We deserve damnation. But God, he showed us something else. Mercy and his love. 
We must never forget when looking at the lost with all their sins and their drugs and their sex and their pride and their rock culture dress and their looks and their piercings and their drinking and their humanism and their tattoos and their hate and their false religion that God had mercy on us and he will certainly have mercy on them. Don't ever look at somebody and say that person's too gone for God to save. That's the, that's the people he would really like to save. That is the, per that is the people that he is, uh, 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 he is perfect in saving because a person who sees their sin is ready for a savior. Don't ever shy away from telling somebody that they say, well, that, that person will never receive a track. That, never, that person will never, he has no inclinations. Listen, you don't have any inclinations towards being a Christian. You, you verse four, you but God. He steps in, but God. You're a children of wrath. I don't care if you, you're all shaved and you all look all perfect and you got your, your long dress and you got your big A-frame culottes or whatever you got. You know, everything. You look perfect. All right? You're perfect. That's no more inclination to be saved than the person right now that's on Skid Row in Wilmington. No more inclination. It's but God. It is His grace. It is His perfect and wonderful grace. God has more mercy than DuPont has money. And the word itself, mercy, carries with the idea of compassion. It carries the idea of willingness to give. Mercy, this word, but God who is rich in mercy. It does, it's not, he's, doesn't, he's not rich in mercy to hoard it. He's rich in mercy because he wants to give it. He is the great philanthropist, or purr, whatever the word is. He is willing to give, willing to give. When we see a terrible, hard, and belligerent world, we must remember God is willing to give them mercy. He has great riches and he wants to share it. Why would he give a sinner like me mercy? It says in the verse, uh, it says, But God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. The word for, because, put in your brain the word because. He wants to give me great mercy because that mercy is backed from one of his characteristics. And that is his love. He has great love. Love that we don't understand. And notice it's described here as great love. Why is it great? The whole evangelistic idea of God loves you, you're special, is rubbish. You're special, all right. You're so special that you're verse number one through three. The unsaved are special. We were special. We were so special that we were children of Satan. That's special. God's great love has nothing to do with you're special, so God loves you. Nothing to do with you at all. Nothing to do with that. You've got to rid yourself of that idea. Now the greatness, why God's love is great, is because it is totally independent of the recipient. That is why it is great. It's no great thing when you love back somebody who loves you. It's no great thing when you love somebody who deserves to be loved. It's no great thing when someone has given you something and you give it to them back. Here in His love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and gave His Son to be the propitiation for our sin. It's not great love. He did not respond to anything in us. Let me give you an expl explain why it's great love. I'm going to give you an illustration. I was attracted to Amy for several reasons. I'll just be very honest. I'm just going to confess it to you. She was pretty. John, she was really pretty. Saw her in college. Very pretty. I was attracted to her because of that. She had a good personality. She wasn't one of these loud women. Guys on the front row here, loud women are the ones that you date, but you don't marry them. All right? All right? She wasn't, in fact, she hardly said anything. She just, I met her serving the Lord. And I saw, she was, she was just serving the Lord with children. There's things that just really, and she's got brown eyes. I can say all this because she's not here. She had beautiful brown, that attracted me to her. And she was nice. And she laughed at my jokes. And I mean, I, there were so many things that attracted me to her, okay? Now listen to me. There are reasons why you like or loved your spouse or liked your spouse. There's a reason why, why you like your friends because something clicks there. There's no reason that God loved you. That's why it's great love. Will you let that go to the very depths of your soul? There was nothing attractive that he saw in you, yet he decided to love you. I will give you a further illustration. If you go to Wilmington tonight and find the worst, the most hateful, rapist, child abuser, foul, and nasty criminal that would rather kill you than talk to you. And you brought him gifts and made him food and called him and spent time with him and brought him into your home to live with you, that would be great love. Because yeah. there's nothing in that fellow that merits it. That's a little bit like God. 
That's what God showed us. All our righteousness, even the best things that we can offer him, are as filthy rags to him. We had nothing desirable, only we were dead in sins, and we were verse number one through three. That's how he found us. There was absolutely nothing. Can you understand? I can't understand that kind of love because we don't experience it here. We can't experience it on this earth. God explains it over and over in his word. There was nothing contingent that we had done that made him love us. There was nothing desirable about us. Everything was putrid. And yet he, he of his own love, he showed mercy and pity and compassion and chose to love us. That's amazing. It's amazing. How he found us, what he showed us, now how he changed us. Look at verse number five. Even when we are dead in sins, hath quickened us or made us alive together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. And hath raised us up together, that is with Christ, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus or through, or by, or by the power of Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and then not of yourself, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Note, here it is, once we were dead, now we are alive to God, we are quickened, we are made alive. Listed here are three ways that God made us alive. He changed us, he made us alive together with Christ. The theology goes like this, this is in the first verse, five. Uh, theology goes like this, when Jesus rose from the dead, he claimed the power, all power is given unto me, and that part of that power is he gave us power to spiritually be made brand new, salvation life, we are alive. First, at the beginning, three verses, we're dead to God, and now we're alive to God. He made us alive spiritually, something we could never do. Romans 6 verse 4 says, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism unto death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of God, even, even now we should walk in newness of life. That resurrection, when Christ moved the stone away and came out, that we think of as Easter Sunday morning or Resurrection Sunday, that raising was the direct theological power that gives you the power not to be what you used to be. Gives you a new life. As he raised, he had the power to raise you from verse 1 through 3. And as he is raised, you are raised. The passage in Romans 6 that I quoted goes on to explain that we were, uh, we're not now dead in sin anymore. We're dead to sin. Not dead in sin. We're alive with Christ and we can have a righteous life by super, supernatural power. We're dead. We have different desires. We have different strength to be able to conquer addictions and problems that we never were able to do before, before Christ became, uh, we became alive in Christ. Look at, look at this raising together in verse number six. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Not only did he spiritually raise us up to live a new, alive life to God, but he did something that breaks all of the, the, the natural powers of time what we think about. We are limited by gravity. If you don't believe me, go on top of the church roof and jump off. You're going to find what happens. One day I about fell out my window. There was a pe I know whose fault it was too. It was Wayne Frist's fault. There was a, there was a, there was a, a, a screwdriver or something that was, was out the window and I leaned out the window to get it and about fell off the roof. Gravity takes hold of us. Boy, that's a deep concept, isn't it, Pastor Valiente? We are limited by time. There is time. There's time. Tomorrow you do this. Yesterday there's time. God's not limited by any of that stuff. Not at all. And here is something that, that defies the laws of time. It says he made us sit together with Jesus in heavenly places or in the heavenlies. Now if you were here at the beginning of Ephesians chapter 1, you know what I'm about to say. Now I know where Jesus sits. I know where he is. Where is he? Yell out. Where is he right now? He's the right hand of the Father. I know where he is. This verse says it's a divine reality in God's reality, which is much more real than ours, that we are now already seated with Jesus Christ in heaven. That defies all time and all physical understanding that we have, but I kind of I think God's not going to apologize for that. How great is our eternal security. We are already in heavenly places, this verse says. Read it again. Look at it. And hath raised us up together. Raised is past tense. And made us sit together presently in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You do the background language. Guess what you're going to find? We're there. I can't explain that. But we are securing Christ. I can explain that. 
It's not a metaphor. It's not a future thing. It's a theological past truth of our salvation. God saving us is so short in His time. We're already there in Jesus. I know a song like that. Anybody know that song? We're already over on the other side, waiting on a brand new body. Uh, we're sitting up there in, in the heavenly fair on the right hand of the Father, our citizenship in heaven. We're living in Christ, you see. We're already there in heaven, just waiting for our body to be. I can't explain that, but it's true. Three times the word together is used about us in Jesus. It is all because together, together, together. We're not pulling the cart. He's pulling the cart. We just happen to be yoked to Jesus. All right, together, together, together in these three verse, or these verses here. Three times together is used in Christ Jesus. It's all because of what he has done. Notice the reminder in verse number five, we're saved by grace. By grace you're saved. He throws that in there, not for us to throw that out as a soul winning verse, although it's a wonderful soul winning verse, but he just wants you to know that it's not your fault. You're not there because you got yourself there. In fact, listen, look, look at verse number, uh, number eight and verse number nine. There's almost a chuckle of humor in this. It says, for by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It's almost, you know, it's sarcasm. Not of yourself. It's a gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. It's almost sarcasm. There's no way that anyone here could think that they are going to earn their way to heaven or that, that they can do anything but praise God for his wonderful grace. The, first, the third way he'll change us is in the future. The verse is verse number seven. It says that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us through Jesus Christ. That in the ages to come, it plays off of verse number six that we're already seated so that in eternity he can pour his grace on us, his exceeding riches of his grace on or toward us. You see, his kindness, look at the word kindness in verse number seven. It's talking about what he's going to do to us in the future. It's the word gentleness. Gentleness or kindness. It doesn't stop when you enter the gates of heaven. Normally we think like this. God did wonderful things for us in the past. And we're going to be so good and we're going to pop into the gate of heaven, allow us heaven, we're going to be in heaven. This verse says this, that in the ages to come, he's going to keep on pouring his kindness and his grace on us forever because he wants to. We can't even imagine how incredible that will be, but it's not, and I'm convinced that the wonderful thing will not be looking at the past, although that would be wonderful, but in, in the future, we, were, we are going to be blessed in such great ways that are even as great as our, the day that we got saved. He is forever going to, in ages to come, when is that? Forever and ever and ever. More grace, more kindness, more gentleness. I certainly understand why Jesus is exalted, but here, here together, I can't understand why I am. This becoming alive and sitting with Jesus and riches for ages to come makes no sense to you and me. It is a wonderful thing beyond our comprehension. And here is the reason we profit forever. In verse number five, in verse number seven, in verse number eight, you see the same word mentioned three times because of his grace. If anything that we are uh, guilty of in this church is that someone may not come here because we preach about God's grace too much, all right? That's a wonderful thing to be accused of. But I can't stop talking about it because it's a wonderful thing to me because I know where God brought me from. In verse number 8 through 9, he emphasizes all this rescue work of restoration and renovation of your life that God invested in us is not to focus on ourselves but on his grace. Look at verse number 8, please. It says, For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. His focus is on his grace, what he did, where he found you in verse number one through three, what he showed you, his riches and his love, what he, how he changed you. It's all focused on his grace. In the ages to come, it will be the praise of his grace. And he will just pour his grace more and more and more and more from eternity. He said, what, how's that going to look every day? I have no idea. It's going to be wonderful though. And he'll pour it out and pour it out and pour it out and we'll enjoy it forever and ever and ever. And we will always praise his grace forever. What did he make us and what does he want us to do right now? What is the so what of these things? All this stuff that I preach to you. We can walk out of here praising the Lord. That would be good. But he doesn't end his thought that way. That's not what he does. He wants you to understand, you know, verse number one through three, how he found you. In verse number four, what he showed you. In verse number five, uh, through verse number nine, of what he made you by his grace, or, or, or how he changed you by his grace. But he wants you to see that he didn't just change you to sit around 
and wait till eternity starts or wait till heaven starts. And that's the last thing here we want to see tonight. It's in verse number 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus and all good works, which God hath foreordained that we should walk in them. Verse 10 says that he worked on us for us to work on others by good works. What is the so what? He did a good work in us and determined before he ever made Adam and Eve that, and you see in, the, in verse number 10, the end of it, he before ordained, before he ever made Adam and Eve, he decided he would save us. And in the time that we waited after we were saved until the time we die and are raptured, we are made for a purpose. Workmanship is the idea of a product. He made us for a reason. You say, what are you talking about? Look at workmanship in verse number 10. For we are his workmanship, literally product, like a master artist creating something. Let me explain to you like this. Let's just say that you make your house beautiful. There are people in every neighborhood that it's like they have nothing else to do but to work on their house. I wish I had that time, but even when I do have the time, I just can't see spending all that time digging out dandelions. I can't see that. Okay. Let's just say that you, you, had, you made your house beautiful. And I mean, it was so gorgeous. I mean, you painted everything, you renovated everything, you got new windows, and you got flowers here, and everything's blue. And it's oh, just, just gorgeous. People walk, or drive by your house, and they go, oh. and, uh, you know, I mean, just gorgeous. And it gets attention. In fact, it's written up in the newspaper. And then it's written up in a magazine, and pictures are taken of it. And then the people at HGTV come, and they, say, they show it on television. Let me ask you just a question. Who gets the praise for that? Is it the house or the one who made it that way? It's the one who made it that way. Okay, the house didn't do it for itself. And that's kind of the picture of all eternity, what happens. That who gets the praise for what he's made? We are his, we are his product. The word workmanship in verse number 10. We are his product. And, but it's to his praise. The house doesn't get the praise. And what are we supposed to do? What's the so what that you can end here tonight with? The so what is found in the middle of verse 10. For his work, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. He has made us a good work so that we may renovate somebody else. So that we may have good works on other people. That certainly can include soul winning, but certainly is not stopping there. It is all good works. We are a work. We are a product so that we can shed good works on other people. That's really what he wants us to be doing. As you think of the great things that God has done for you tonight by saving you, what can you do for someone else that would show grace and mercy and kindness and a reflection of what he has done in your life? Appreciation. You want to show appreciation to God. Yes, you can praise him. But one great thing you can do is, as his product, you be a product of good works to other people. Is it physical help that you could do? Is it financial help that you could do for somebody else? Is it words or a call or a visit or tears or prayer? We certainly have a lot of people that could be blessed. Little Frankie fell down the stairs and uh, he was taking the AI DuPont. As far as I know, he might be home now, but he was there with a concussion for a couple of days. Someone ought to be calling Tommy Lynn. And that mama's probably really concerned about her, her little boy. Denise Barton's Yesterday, her mother went, or her grandmother went home to eternity, 93 years old. Someone ought to be loving her. And every one of you have your own little situation. If I didn't mention yours right now, please forgive me, but each one of you, we need to be a pattern. We need to be a reflection of good works. God has made us a beautiful house. We're his workmanship. And we, while we are waiting for that ages to come, it is our job to be reflecting that good love and mercy by working for other people.